We are very pleased to have you all back tonight for one another one of our uh, Dolly and Science lecture series. We have uh, two or more of these scheduled um, on the second Thursday of November. We have um, talked basically about, uh, about Young in relation to uh, um, Dali. So a psychological perspective a little bit different than Sigmund Freud. And then in December, we're very pleased to have uh, Francis Tobian who's going to be talking about uh, Dali in relation to occult literature. So definitely some interesting things coming up. But tonight you are here for Dali, Illusion, and Cognitive Psychology. So you're going to hear some very fun and entertaining and I think uh, informative insights into both how Salvador Dali works and also some of the things that we take for granted about the way that we perceive the world around us. So I'm very pleased that we have uh, Dr. White with us tonight. Holly White is going to be here to talk about uh, some of the things that she shares with her students at Eckerd College concerning uh, cognitive psychology and just the way that we perceive the world and the way we can be led astray by hallucinations and other great things. So with that, I'm going to start on my portion, which is going to be focusing on optical illusions in relation to Dali. And the very first thing to mention is that Dali grew up at the turn of the century, born in 1904, and he was young enough to still really enjoy and experience uh, a lot of the toys that were so popular in the mid to late 1800s, such as the Stereopticon and the Zoetrope. So the Stereopticon, we know probably many of us know it as the uh, Viewmaster, but uh, back in the 1800s, it was a way that you could turn a two-dimensional image into an amazing perspectival vision of depth. And it was uh, basically secured with the left-hand side, two images very similar but slightly different in the way that they were photographed, thus allowing for this deep perspective. And the invention on the right, the zoetrope, would allow you to look inside as the disc is spinning and you would see the illusion of animation. So he was delighted by things like this. He was introduced to them as a, a very young boy in school and they always stayed with him and informed his interest in visual culture. The other thing to say is that Dali was the first generation of um, artists who were exposed to the theater and cinema. And so he was an avid uh, enthusiast going to the local cinema to see things like Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin and things like that. So visual culture was, uh, was really transforming in the period of time when he started working as an artist. <coughs> the first illusion I just want to share with you very briefly is one that I'm sure all of you have seen before. It's called All is Vanity. It appeared in Life Magazine in 1892. And it's simply a woman in front of her vanity as she's preparing to go out for the evening probably, looking very beautiful. But of course, the illusion is one that the mirror itself and her reflection basically creates the image of a skull. So we have her two, the two faces forming the two eye sockets, all the, the lovely um, perfume on her counter, on her bureau, that become the teeth inside of the grinning skull's mouth and the mirror itself becoming the shape of the skull. And this, of course, was something that everybody was familiar with even in the, the turn of the century, so it, it's not surprising to see that Dali, being interested in optical phenomena, would eventually go on to use this device to create this lovely um, design for ballet. It's a ballerina. Basically, she's a Spanish dancer. She has a, um, a pattern on her dress that when she stands right in front of this particular shape, she becomes the, uh, the skull. So she's the symbol of beauty, the symbol of fire and desire as she dances, and yet at the same time she transforms into the image of death and the reminder that all things shall pass. So something that Dolly found very appealing. And he went on to then have a similar illusion photographed. This is a very, very popular photograph by Philippe Halsman. In relation to Dali, it's called Involuptate Morse, or um, voluptuous death. So the idea of the female figures, the female nudes, formed in such a way that they create the image of the skull with the eye sockets and the teeth inside of the grinning skull's mouth. Very popular, very fun, and very much modeled on 19th century illusion that Dolly was familiar with. So I'm going to talk first about ambiguous images. And this is really the place where I think all of us uh, are immediately one and the same as we look at illusions in the world around us. Dali had a, a way of describing his approach to paintings, particularly during the Surrealist period. He said he would spend his whole day seated before his easel with his eyes staring fixedly, trying to see like a medium, 
the images that would spring to his imagination. So he's arguing here, or what he's proposing is that he would sit in front of the blank canvas and he would hope that certain images would start to form almost as if they were hallucinations that would then be recorded very, um, very directly without any censorship or any uh, reflection on them. But I think what he was a little closer to being comfortable with was working with memory and phenomena. And so, for example, the Rorschach test is one that we're all familiar with as a proposal for something that will tell us about, in our reaction to the random pattern, something about our personality. And this is a very common idea. It's very much based on looking at clouds, looking at patterns in the wall, and allowing your mind to just roam until you find certain images that are very um, uh, convincing to you. And uh, it was used by psychologists. But uh, Dolly, as a child, spent a lot of time in the rocky areas north of his homeland, um, around Cap de Creus, a little bit north of Port Legat. And he would spend a lot of time looking at the rocks, which had such unusual shapes that many of the fishermen of the community would have names for them. And this particular image here was always known as the head of Calero. And it looks a little bit like a head that's supported on its nose. This would be the forehead. And the chin would be right about here. And he was very familiar with the area, had spent a lot of time there. And eventually, it became the source of Dali's own self-portrait. So this shape here, it's called the, um, it's often known as the Great Masturbator. But it's a portrait shape that shows up over and over again. It looks like a head that's become almost like a fetus that's been washed up on the beach. It looks like there's no skull. The skull has been removed from it. And the head is, uh, the eye is closed. So it's a dreaming figure. And much like the head itself has become very limp and fluid, all of the watches in this landscape are also fluid. But the inspiration for it, which became his own self-portrait, was an area that he had spent time looking at and letting his mind wander into imagining what that face would look like based on the rock that he had seen. By about 1928, a little bit before he became a surrealist, Dali went through a period of experimentation and he became very fascinated by the fact that you could have very loose, abstract forms that could be read in multiple ways. And so, for example, this is a painting from our collection called Big Thumb, Beach, Moon, and Decaying Bird. And the form that, uh, that really interests us is this form right here, which Dolly encouraged people to read in multiple ways. For him, this could be a big thumb, it could be a big toe, it could be a loaf of bread, it could be a phallus, it could be a variety of different things, all simultaneously. So he was really open to this, at this particular moment in his life, with the idea that forms could have multiple ways of being read. Very quickly, that becomes understood in a very different way. Dali, as with his colleagues in the Surrealist uh, group, were very familiar with the writings of Leonardo da Vinci. They were never published by da Vinci, but they were published by one of his students. And they're kind of a random uh, collection of different observations about painting. But one of his observations is his encouragement for young students to study the stains on walls, to study ashes, or grainy stones, or clouds. All of these things are formless, and thus they allow for subjective fantasy. He says, if you consider them well, you'll be able to find really marvelous ideas. So even back in the time of the Renaissance, da Vinci was encouraging people to exercise, well, artists, to exercise their visual imagination using abstract patterns, very much like the Rorschach test and encourages us to do the same thing. And so Dali creates a particular idea that's very complicated, and we're not going to go into the full ramification of it tonight, but it's a, it's a term called the paranoic critical method. And he defines it in a very... Un, um, in a very ambiguous way. He says it's a spontaneous method of irrational knowledge based upon the interpretive critical association of delirious phenomena. Now, I'm sure that's just crystal clear to everybody in this room tonight. Uh, the basic idea is that he's encouraging people to somehow trust hallucinations, to have faith in the visual phenomena of things that don't seem to be there, that are not consensually understood to be in front of us. And he's saying that after they start to appear to you, stand back and start to objectively analyze them. And what you'll find is this incredible web of connections and associations. So in a way, he's, he's, he's very much borrowing from this idea of free association. 
but he's also saying base it on facts, base it on things that you see that may or may not be there, but allow them to overwhelm you and then critically step back and try to utilize the strange associations that come from this experience. So that said, one of Dolly's first experiments in this way had to do with double imagery. And this was painted in 1930. It's called Invisible Sleeping Woman, Horse, and Lion. And in the configuration you're looking at, you can probably see one or two of those images, but there's actually all three of them combined. There's a woman whose head is right over here. She's looking down. She's laying on a probably, I guess, actually out in the field. Her arm is here. Her second arm is here. This is her torso, her breasts, and her backside. But then if you look at that again, you'll notice there's a lion over here, a lion's face with his beard. This becomes the front uh, haunches of the lion, the back haunches, and his tail. But then if we go back to the other side again, you can see the nostrils of a horse, a horse's um, uh, mouth and its mane. This is the front leg of the horse and the hindquarters of the horse with its tail. So we can see all three of those simultaneously within this given configuration. And the important part about this is the world shouldn't operate like this. You know, the world should be one thing and one thing only. And what Dolly's doing by presenting this is if he can get the illusion real enough, he's trying to convince us that perhaps there's slippage. Perhaps we're misreading the world. Perhaps the world is as, multi as nefarious as an image like this, which would have these multiple interpretations that would undermine any sense of permanence or identity. And so here's a, here you can see one of the early sketches for it. There's her head. You can see it changed a little bit. There the horse's head is upright, then it changes. And then there's a detail where you can see a little more clearly the uh, lion, the horse, and the woman that's reclining. So this is where he started with what he called his paranoid critical method. And he was such a good salesman that immediately the leader of the Surrealist group, very early upon talking with Dolly and understanding what he was trying to, uh, to um, defend or explain, uh, Andre Breton winds up saying that Dali has endowed surrealism with the primary instrument of great importance, the paranoid critical method, which is capable of being applied to poetry, to painting, to cinema. So in his mind, Dali had created something that seemed like it could be available for everybody. If you just learn the method, you can go forward in whatever branch of um, artistic creation you're involved in and succeed on some level. Very quickly, he comes to a very different conclusion about that. But um, for Dali, this becomes just this gold mine. It's really like the reservoir of everything that he wants to do with, the, with imagery is presented through this ambiguity. So we're going to start very briefly by talking a little bit about double images. And we're going to start with the classic gestalt image of the Ducker Bunny. And everybody loves the Ducker Bunny because it is such a perfect illustration of ambiguity. Either you see the duck with its beak or bill right over here and its eye, or you see the sweet little bunny with its ears popped up and its eye and its nose up this way. And the remarkable thing, which tells us so much about what uh, actually what uh, Holly's going to be speaking about shortly, is that the mind can either see a duck or it can see a bunny. We can conceptually know that both of them are there simultaneously, but we can't see them both at the same time. Our mind switches one to the other, but it's incapable of holding both simultaneously. And it undermines that sense of consensual reality. You know, Is it a bunny for you? It's a duck for me. Does, what does that mean? You know, it's, it starts to undermine the ability to reason properly. Well, one of Dolly's absolute favorite artist of all time was Vermeer. And this is a particularly beautiful painting. It's called The Young Woman Reading a Letter by an Open Window. And Dolly was looking at this, and he had an idea that perhaps he could turn this into a double image. So around 1938, I believe, he creates this image, which is the image, the picture disappears. And you can see it's the same woman. She's reading the letter. She's sitting here. The curtain is pulled back. And yet, if you start to look at it long enough, you'll realize that it becomes something completely different. It's a gentleman's face. We have the no nose right there and the nostril. We have an eye, a mustache, and a beard. And yeah, it's, it's both simultaneously. It's the girl reading the letter. But it's also Dolly's other hero, which is Velasquez. So this is probably the portrait that it's based on. It's not actually an image of, uh, of Vermeer. It doesn't seem to be, since there's no self-portrait of Vermeer. 
but the pose of it, the, the beard isn't present, but definitely the mustaches and the same sort of features appear on this image of Velasquez. So there's this really curious sense of Dali is taking a very familiar image and turning it into something completely different. Dali goes on to say that the paranoid critical method um, uh, developed out of the ability for the artist to perceive different images within a given set configuration. So with, without changing anything, the image itself metamorphosizes. It transforms. So here's another one of these very, very popular images from the turn of the century. Um, and this is an image that's often referred to as, do you see my, my wife or do you see my mother-in-law? And uh, I'm not sure which one you're looking at right now, but uh, perhaps the wife is the first one that we notice. I'm not sure if that's always true, but her eyelash is turned away from us. This is her chin, her hair, and she's wearing a very lovely uh, uh, headdress with a feather. She has this very elaborate kind of boa or some sort of uh, beautiful um, clothing. But then very quickly that dissolves into a very different image where you have sort of a hag-like woman. This is her nose. These are her two eyes. The, the necklace becomes her mouth, and she's wearing a babushka. You know, so it's a much more peasant type of woman, very elegant young lady or a very peasant older lady. And again, just delightful as a child, and yet Dali retained that sense of surprise, and that's what he applied to images like, uh, like this. So there's a very important moment in Dali's life where he says that he's looking for a postcard of a photograph of a painting by Picasso, one of his Cubist paintings. It's a portrait. And when he saw this postcard, he picked it up thinking he had found the right one. And it was only afterwards when he was walking out of the door that he looks at it and realizes it's, it's you know, a group of, uh, of tribal figures in front of an African hut. And he stops for a minute, and it, it, it makes him think that, you know, what was it? I was looking for something and I found it, even though it wasn't there. And so what he did is he took the same postcard to Andre Breton, his friend, and said, um, what do you see in this postcard? Well, Breton had been obsessed by the Marquis de Sade, and for whatever reason, that was the image that he saw when Dolly showed it to him the way that he had first perceived it. So Dolly's looking for Picasso, he finds it. The Breton's looking for the de Sade, he finds it. And yet, clearly, it's neither of those things. So to capture the illusion that Dolly experienced, you basically just have to turn the postcard on its side, and I'm not sure if you can see it yet, but when you see what he painted and put it on its side, very clearly you have the two eyes, the nose, the lips, the chin, and the hair. And we can see why it could be the Marquis de Sade, as well as um, why it would seem a little bit like a Picasso portrait. But here's the illusion as it's completed by Dali, and here's what it started as. So for, for Dali, this became, this really convinced him that he was absolutely right about this idea of um, objective subjectivity, the paranoid critical method, the idea that you could have hallucinations that could lead to new discoveries that were true for you, but you could convince somebody else of the, that reality, even if it wasn't there to begin with. So he goes on to say that the way in which it's been possible to obtain a double image is clearly paranoid. By a double image, it's meant such a representation of an object that it is also, without the slightest physical or anatomical change, the representation of an entirely different object, the second one being equally devoid of any deformation. So basically what we've been saying all along, that without changing the image, it's two completely different things that are contradictory. Which brings us to one of the really profound images in Dali's career. This is a work called España. It's basically a celebration of Spain as shown to be a female figure. So we have a, a rather beautiful female figure sitting here leaning on this, um, this piece of furniture, and she's in the open area. And the idea is she's the personification of the country. And she's based on something that Dolly was very familiar with as a child. This is an image, the one on the right, that actually hung over his bed when he was growing up. And you can see it's almost the exact same image, just inverted. Um, but the same sort of pose that we see on her face same looking away. <clears throat> but when we get very close, what you'll notice is something quite different. And this is probably too distorted to read, but this is the close-up of the face, so that uh, we have her two eyes, we have her lips, the side of her face, and her hair. But maybe you can start to make out that there's actually a lot of people standing there, that the face is actually made up of figures on horseback, 
There's people observing what's going on. There's a figure here with a long dress. And what's actually happening is that these figures on horseback are at war with one another. So the idea is that Spain, which is represented by this beautiful woman, the beauty actually comes from the violence of the figures themselves that make up her face. So she's completely made of the opposite of what she seems to be. So there's this kind of paranoid contradiction right at the very heart of the way that she's presented. Dali says, uh, and this is, I think, a pretty important way of understanding his approach to double images. He says, I believe the moment is at hand when it will be possible to systematize confusion and contribute to the total discrediting of the world of reality. His goal, which is a very strange goal, is to make sure that anything that seems to have some sort of rational explanation can be undermined as quickly as possible so that we are constantly surrounded by a world that's in flux, that we can't count on, that is completely hallucinatory. This is where he says he wants to be living and where he wants to essentially use his paintings to spread this virus to us. He wants us to start to doubt the world that's around us as well. So it's a, it's a somewhat profound goal that he has. And then just very briefly before we talk about the, double, the multiple images, there's a type of illusion that's referred to, um, at least a type of artistic image, that's referred to as a composite image. And Archimbaldo was the great master of it. So here we have his image of summer, where we have a gentleman who's actually made up of all the summer vegetables that you would find out in the, um, in the farm outside of the city. And it's very convincing. The illusion works both ways. We can see clearly what he's made out of, and yet we can actually see very much not just a portrait of a man, but a man that we think we actually know. There's real detail to the way he's articulated. Well, Dali was certainly familiar with him, as were his colleagues in the Surrealist group. And he creates, almost in response to this, his own composite image called the Great Paranoic. And I'm not sure what you're seeing first, but there's actually there's a face that's made up of a lot of different figures who are shielding their face from us. So there's all kinds of diff different clusters of people who all seem to be hiding their head in shame on some level. So there's a gentleman over here that seems to be sleepwalking. There's another gentleman here who's leaning down. There's a woman here who has her head held down in shame. Another gentleman who's leaning his head onto his hand. And all of these figures suddenly create this double image of what Dali calls the great paranoiac, this person who suffers from paranoia and associations of misleading information. And you can see a little more clearly some of the details here with the bodies. And Dali said that all of my ambition on a pictorial level consists of putting on canvas with the most imperial fury of precision the image of concrete irrationality. So again, his goal is to constantly show us something that can be completely impossible, completely doubtful. And yet if he shows it to us as clearly as possible, it might convince us of the reality of, of this very strange world. So now we come to the multiple images. And I just want to show you a couple images um, to show you what he was able to accomplish. This is one called The Endless Enigma. And what's remarkable about this, Dolly was so impressed by himself after he painted it that when he had a catalog prepared for the show, he actually prepared another page that showed each of the individual illusions that he's hidden within the configuration of the, um, of the image. So the Endless Enigma actually has six very specific illusions that are hidden within the, uh, the painting. Uh, the first one is the philosopher. And I think you can see the gentleman resting his head. These are his legs. And we can see that same head. He's resting his head. His legs are configured in the landscape over here. The second image is of a greyhound. And the greyhound appears right here. Those are the two front legs and the back haunches over here. The third one is a still life, which contains a mandolin and a bowl of fruit. And here's the mandolin with the tuning pegs and the bowl of fruit with the uh, um, pears inside of it. Then it completely transforms that same image as a boat with fishing nets on a beach. So this is actually the ship at this point. And this is a woman with her back to us mending a fishing net. In the fifth image, it's a mythical beast, which we'll just have to take his word for. But the pears right here become the face looking back. This is the front legs. And this is the hind quarters of the, uh, the creature. And then the last one is the image of the one-eyed cyclops. And the fruit dish at this point becomes clearly lips, 
nose and one eye with the other eye seemingly missing. But here, what Dolly has accomplished is not just showing us a double image, but something that's constantly in flux, constantly metamorphosizing into something completely different. So it's that idea of undermining any sense of stability in the way that we approach the world. And now I'm going to jump all the way up to our gala contemplating the Mediterranean because what's really fascinating about this piece, this is at the very end of Dolly's life. Um, he's 72 years old. He's reading an article in, in Scientific American about visual perception. And basically what they've done in the article is they take the image of Abraham Lincoln and they distort it and pixelate it into, I believe, 160 or 170 pixels going through uh, white to black in different stages. And the fascinating thing in this article was it was asking what are the, what are the barriers or the um, outside brackets of visual perception? How much or how little information do you need in order to recognize something you can already see, you already are familiar with? And for all of us looking on the left-hand side, you can probably make out the image of Abraham Lincoln. Well, Dolly thought he would go one step beyond this. He thought, you know, not only is that the kind of thing that I'm engaged in, but I can take that distorted image and turn it into a completely different image. And that's what he's done in this, uh, this painting. If you squint your eyes, you clearly see the Abraham Lincoln. And yet what he's done is he's completely created it out of a, another image. It's an image of his wife in front of the window. So this kind of idea of transformation and, and images in flux is brought to its zenith in a way with this painting. And there, even to make sure that people didn't miss it, he glued in the actual image that he cut out of the article. So he wanted to make sure that everybody's impressed you know, by, uh, by his uh, amazement. <laughs> And in order for people to see this when he was working on it, he was actually creating this in a hotel room, the St. Regis. And obviously there's no ability to get back far enough to see the illusion. So what he had was actually a pair of binoculars. And he would encourage people to look in the wrong end of the lens and the optical phenomena would be transformed and distorted so that you could see very clearly the image of Abraham Lincoln. You know, so it's almost like he's going back to his childhood again, to those toys and apparatus that, uh, that he really enjoyed. And so the last image that I'm going to end with uh, before inviting Holly up is an image that's actually on loan to us right now. It's across the, uh, in the Huff Galleries, across from our permanent galleries. This is an image by Dali of Las Meninas. It's the painting that was created by his great hero, Velazquez. And the Las Meninas is this little detail right here. And I'm sure by now all of you have caught up with the idea that clearly this looks a little bit like a Viewmaster kind of image. And that's because it is. This was done at the same year as the Lincoln, 1975 to 76. And this was intended to be looked at in a particular way. When Dali was creating it, he created it with a series of mirrors. And so when you, if you were to put your head right there, mirror, this mirror over here would reflect in one eye this painting. Your other eye would see this painting. And just like a view master or a stereo opticon, suddenly you would have the two images overlaid and you would have that three-dimensional effect. So I'm not sure if you can see that. If any of you can cross your eyes, you can enjoy this illusion right now. If you can't cross your eyes, it won't help you when you go upstairs because there's no viewing apparatus to help you to see the illusion. But he became fascinated by this idea that you can paint two-dimensional images that would have this incredible illusion of depth. And uh, it's based on this image, which was conceptually about depth and perception and reflection. And what he's done is he's physically made it into this sort of scientific study of depth in the, um, the canvas. So here, again, your right eye would look at this mirror and see the image. Your left eye would look at this mirror and see this image. And immediately, you're taken back to that childhood moment of looking in the Viewmaster and that sense of euphoria and simplicity that somehow you're creating illusions that defy reality, that replace reality, that somehow intensify the experience of art. And so the last uh, statement by Dali, and then we can have Holly come up, is this quote that I found, which is just great. Dali says, to look is to invent. That we are basically trained in such a way that we're not only um, looking at the world, but in the process of looking, we're completely transforming what we're seeing and understanding the world differently every time we go and look at the same configuration. So that's just in a nutshell, the idea is about Dolly in relation to double imagery. And now what, uh, what we're going to enjoy is 
um, Holly White, who is going to talk to us about cognitive psychology and visual perception and some of the illusions from uh, the world of perception itself. So with that. What I want to do today is show you that Dali, in fact, was not very far off with his idea that we interpret everything. We are actually constructing information from a visual image that is inherently ambiguous an impossible figure and what most vision scientists will tell you is that ambiguity and deception in the visual image is not the exception it's the rule so the idea is that for any given object or visual image that we look at, there are multiple possible interpretations. And what we do is simply select the interpretation that best matches our sensory input. You may see the illusion of movement. Some of these illusions don't work for everybody, but many people will see movement. When you look at one part of this image, it will disappear, and then when you move your eyes, you may see it again. This particular type of arrangement of edges tends to stimulate motion detectors in the brain so that it can trick you. And of course, people were talking about the idea of hallucinations and vision before Dali, as far as, or as early as Plato, of course, and the, the idea of the allegory of the cave and what's real and what's not. And then in a popular movie, The Matrix, the idea that everything that you experience visually is a construction based on your interpretation of what comes in through your eyes and optic nerve into your brain. So in the sense that what is real would be a contrast to a hallucination then nothing would be exactly real. Naive realism is the term used to describe the idea that what we see, what's in front of us, is simply a reflection of what's actually there without any thought or interpretation involved. You can see that even the orientation of this figure may change your interpretation. So the same image. This is a variation of the wife-mother-in-law type illusion, of course, but you could see this as a neck, perhaps, or as it comes up here, as maybe a crown for a princess. When it's turned over, maybe an older woman, the hair. Another example uh, to perhaps illustrate this difference between seeing something and actually perceiving it. Exactly. <laughs> it's a, just a, a rotating mask. But at some point, as it changes, even though you have this constant change of the image, this light stimulus on your eye, your perception of it as being either convex or concave shifts at some point. You almost feel that change. Silhouette dancer. Is she dancing clockwise or counterclockwise? How many of you see her rotating toward the left in clockwise? The other, did she change? Which way is she going? Now it turns out you could interpret it either way. It's inherently ambiguous. Sometimes it gets almost fixed, and we continue to interpret it the same way. Is it fixed? I have, there's a, yeah, a student in perception class that swears it's, oh, you're trying, and I would say, 
It's amazing when it does change. What's amazing are the variations on this illusion. If you were to take multiple copies of this and put them in smaller size all over the screen, you would see about half going in one direction and half going in the other. But then if you split them to create a butterfly pattern symmetrically in the screen, those on the left would synchronize and those on the right would synchronize because of our brain's built-in hardwired preference for symmetry. Which is interesting too because Dali once said that the only real structure is that the spiral helix in DNA. And in fact, we do have this hardwired preference for symmetry, although even then there is this built-in ambiguity, it's guesswork. Don't worry, I won't go into this. I just want to say that, in fact, all we really have to work with, we have this elaborate eye. And you see, we've got these eyeballs, but really their main function is simply to collect and direct light to the back of our eye, where it's then taken in, sent to the brain, and that's where the real processing begins. The visual image to start with is very impoverished. It's just light, light in the absence of light. We have to construct things like edges, boundaries. We have to determine what is part of a form, what is part of background. Classic. Here, on this side, you see a structure Right, the bridge, and this that I'm pointing to is part of what you would say is the figure. And the white, maybe representing the clouds or so, would be the background. But at some point, that shifts, that changes in this illusion such that your background becomes your figure, and your figure becomes background. And of course, it's the deliberate construction of this illusion, and yet, we always have to figure out what is figure and what is background in order to construct our vision. It's just a simple demo here. I could ask you, um, let's just imagine that you've got this black rectangle of construction paper. And I could tell you that these circles could either represent holes that are cut out so that you can peek through to the back, or Perhaps they are cut out construction paper that has been laid on top of the rectangle. So you have different choices in terms of how you might interpret that. If you had to guess, does this look like it might be a hole to look through to the back or, or a figure? Hard to know. What about this? Yes. Does it look the same? You don't have much to work with. Does this help? Does it change? Now you have context. Now your brain can kick in a little bit of problem solving and say, oh, OK, well, yeah. Here you have a larger frame of reference that this must be background. Because we tend to see what's larger there is the background. And then this would be a figure on the background. And then you'd say, oh, well, it makes sense that that should be a cutout. So that would be background. And here also a cut through because it must be part of this strip that's underneath and maybe that's a something laying on top so there's all this ambiguity you think well how can there be any consistency in what we see if even at the level of sorting out what's figure and background we could be so easily duped well the, the gestalt psychologist would say that we do so by going with the simplest construction and then, as I mentioned earlier, the idea of if all of this is a hallucination, we would go with what best matches the visual input. And then, of course, what makes the most sense? It seems more likely, given our visual experience, that one construction versus another would be preferred. And I'll show you. 
Some species have adapted, of course, to try to thwart our ability to tell figure from ground. If you are potentially prey, it would behoove you to not be seen, not be noticed, or perhaps to be considered part of the object that you're attached to. Of course, if you look closely, that's a wing, right? And there's a little bug. based on our visual experience and learning, we're also able to do things that even the most sophisticated computer programs have trouble with, like a simple edge detection. What shape do you see here? An arrow. But if your job were simply to detect the edges, as in the boundaries of two areas that differ in luminance, for example, Photoshop, using the find edges filter, you'd come up with something like this. And it's got a couple pieces missing. Well, what's going on? It's, this is a tough one to see through because we're somewhat hardwired to uh, see a complete arrow. But if you were to cover up certain pieces, you would see, actually, and again, it is very tough. You almost have to just kind of peek through. There is no difference here. And even standing at this distance, it's very hard for me to see. I keep seeing this, distant, uh, this difference in gradient, but it's not so. Here, and then again up here, you have a portion of the figure where there's right? I see some of you kind of covering up part of your visual image, and truly you've got to do it that way in order to see that there's no difference. Your brain spares you from that most of the time. It fills in the gaps for you. It's probably an arrow, so let's just see an arrow. Close enough. Couple fun illusions to go in here. Um, I said earlier that we use context surrounding information to try to determine what's going on, but it can definitely lead to some visual trickery. Everything is relative in vision. Because of this context, you have a size illusion that happens, whereby sometimes the blue dot looks to be a different size depending on where you're looking. Of course, here it's dwarfed by these larger dots, and here, smaller. Or, you know, these dots. So most times, this would appear to be bigger than that, and in fact, they're the same size. This is, a, it's the same principle, but a different illusion. Here you have context that is responsible for seeing um, luminous differences, color contrast. The center of these two figures is actually exactly the same shape. You may have to try the <laughs> looking through your thing because, again, and some of these things are somewhat hardwired in that we have parts of our brain that are devoted to detecting these luminance differences and computing things in a relative fashion such that it doesn't matter so much what's everywhere else. We're just looking at one thing and we're saying this relative to the thing next to it is lighter or darker. There's more light. And so, then when you perceive the hole next to another hole, you know, compared to this, you compute the shade here and here. And this thing is darker than that. And it's hard just on the basis of your knowledge to penetrate the illusion. You really do have to cover up the context generally with your hand. Another context illusion, um, which also has elements uh, of the Gestalt psychology, this whole idea that the whole figure is greater than the sum of its parts, that there are emergent qualities that are different from the individual pieces. So um, I did this with a ruler, so I can assure you that, in fact, this is equally spaced. If you look 
at this green dot here, and you had to guess, of course I'm tricking you so you know, you have to second guess, the distance between the green dot and the red dot here versus green dot and blue dot. The green dot looks closer to what? Right. And they're the same. Exactly the same, I promise. I, I, it was difficult to move those things over and not trick myself. I had a ruler up on my screen, and I tell you that it's true. But in fact, um, we have a tendency based on these things where we, we basically explore our visual world as children, and we learn that there are certain correlations between different things, different relationships, patterns, and we use those to make judgment calls. And then if somebody intentionally sets things up to throw us off, we're trapped in that one time out of many where we're in the exception, and that's an illusion. Here, these guys are just all kind of part of the same thing. Putting this here in this symmetry, and uh, I try, <laughs> it's fairly symmetrical. It's symmetrical enough to create the illusion anyway. You kind of say this goes with this, and you minimize, oops, you minimize the difference there. So there's a lot of visual experience that is the basis of visual perception. Here, I'm going to talk about the probability or the likelihood. It's easiest to illustrate with something like this. Many times we'll perceive one shape coming forward at us with four shapes behind that shape. So I don't want to assume we all see it, but what appears to be coming forward toward you? What shape? This? Like a rectangle? Right. And it may be that you have four black circles with a rectangle lying over them. Or it could be that you have four Pac-Man-like things that happen to be perfectly arranged. It could, write, it could be either. Of course, it's flat. It's two-dimensional. It's not three-dimensional. It's flat. But based on our experience in the world, it is more likely to be a rectangle on top of circles. Those things occur more frequently. It is much less likely that there are these little Pac-Man things and that someone just happened to arrange them so symmetrically and so perfectly. We know that irregularities in visual world are much more frequent. Because of time, I didn't create this as a video clip. <laughs> this is actually uh, my nephew and I somehow accidentally videoed him discovering what I think is some, one of these principles. And he was kind of tottering around, and I happened to be filming him. And he came up to this pillar. He held on to it like so. And he's gazing on one side. Then he kind of stands back, and he looks at the other side. He stands back. And then he turns toward the camera, and he throws his hands up, and he's got this huge smile on his face. The world is the same on both sides. Well, that's exciting, but he's not even old enough to talk. So, you know, chances are you don't record all of that in your memory, all the times you first discovered that well, these things are what they are. But when you hear someone tell a little kid, okay, don't, don't touch that, don't touch that, and they say, I'm not, I'm just looking. You say, no, you're touching. It, it's all the same to a child, looking and touching. They are developing their visual system by seeing what these correlations are so that we could look at a surface, we could look at um, a plush carpet and see the texture and know what it would feel like, even if we haven't felt it before, that particular carpet, because we've seen examples, we've, we've been able to see what is the relationship there between the touch to that surface and the way it looks. Kids touch everything. I had to kind of pick and choose what I included here so that I don't do an entire course. But I do want to throw out one of the things that, that I really like to talk about, which is depth perception. Because if we're talking about illusions and hallucinations and other things here, well, it's really funny to think about 3D and 3D movies and 3D vision and everything, because we are always creating the third dimension. 
light hits the back of our eye and hits a surface that's the retina, that's flat, a somewhat curved surface, but it's two-dimensional, it's flat. And then that information is sent to the brain. So where does this depth come from? There are multiple <laughs> sources. One of the things that we've been focusing on is regularities in the visual world. So I could point out to you that there are certain clues that we come across, certain regularities, things that appear to be the case that help inform our judgments and decisions about what is closer to us or further away from us. Things like linear perspective. Here, when we see two lines converging off to the, or appear to be converging in the distance, when they come to a point, and even, in fact, height, the fact that they come to a point, what appears to be a horizon off in the distance, higher in the visual field, you see, in this direction height. We see that as a road going down into the distance. So those lines converging imply depth, such that as they get closer together, they're further from us. And the same type of thing here. Um, just a, a couple other things here. Um, this one is, appears to be kind of bulging out at you. The idea would be, if something were closer to you, then it should appear as a larger object on your retina. And so if you take a flat two-dimensional surface and you have things that are larger versus smaller, you will infer that, in fact, they must be closer. And the other thing is a texture gradient. You see there's lots and lots of these little circles that appears to be closer together, clumped together, off to the distance. Again, things that you learn, but you may not be aware of having learned them. But I know as a little girl, I would like to pick flowers in the field, and I would be in one spot, and there's not that many flowers. But I look way down the field, and I see a great spot because there's tons of flowers. They're rushing over there, and it's the same. Well, what's going on? Well, I was tricked by a texture gradient. more illusion. So sometimes, again, when we have conflicting sources of depth information, they trick us. So here we've got a couple things going on. And first I went to say, does this appear any smaller to you than this object? They are. You may have. I'm being kind with these illusions. I really have to bring out the big guns for my perception students because they're a little more skeptical at this point. And it takes a lot to rile them up or before they'll say I'm tricking them. But in fact, yes. But all the visual cues are telling you otherwise. So it's the linear perspective is telling you that that object appears to be higher in the visual field is further away. The fact that it is higher in the visual field suggests that it's further away. Objects that are further from us in reality, do appear to be higher, set higher in the visual field. And as they get further away from us, they cast a smaller size image on our retina. So here, when all of these cues are telling us that, that in the back here is further away from us, and yet because I'm telling you they're the same size, they put the same size picture on your retina. So you're going, well, the only way that could happen is if this one in reality is much bigger. Because then it's further away and then it will look smaller, so it'll look about the same. Your brain's having to sort of weigh in all this input, make sense of it. And in the end, maybe constructs a bit of a hallucination in that sense. This might be, <laughs> oh, of course. Yes, that's actually another of our depth cues that we call our visual depth cues. And sometimes that will be called the, the gradient of detail or it's very similar to something called atmospheric perspective because, in fact, light has to travel to our retina from over a distance. And 
if you have things in the air, whether it be dust particles or water droplets, they're going to scatter the light and make things appear more blurry. So the more distance there is between your eyes and the object, the fuzzier it gets. So again, it's tricky. I mean, your brain is being logical and saying that the one in the back is bigger. There's more evidence painted into this, you know, to suggest that that's the case. <laughs> yeah, that too. And now, there are many accounts of people who have had their vision restored after years of blindness or sometimes even cataracts removed um, that have been present since early, early childhood. And these individuals will actually have to learn to see. They will need to use a walking stick for something like what you perceive clearly as being a ledge because the only thing that tips you off in this case is where you're perceiving these lines to be relative to one another. And you perceive this ledge and you infer, okay, this is going to be a drop off, but just your ability to perceive depth. And then the, another powerful depth cue is comparing the input to the two eyes, this binocular um, perspective. So in fact, this might be the right size that you could do this, this image, where if you were to cover one eye, you can choose one of these circles. I believe I only have one more slide anyway. Cover a circle, choose one to cover it with perhaps your right finger, index finger, while you're Left eye is covered, so it's sort of covered up, or a brick or whatever you want to cover. Now keep your finger still, uncover your left eye and cover up your right. It's now uncovered. <laughs> now if you if you could if you could kind of keep that eye shut without moving, you know, even with your hand taken away, you could actually then see what basically that distance between where your left eye and your right eye perceive that object to be. And that distance, now if you were to do the same experiment, sitting in the front row, you do the same thing in the back of the room, you would see, in fact, that the distance between your fingers is smaller. So your brain is able to use that to compute depth as well. It's a very powerful depth cue. You can also do that sometimes to see which is your dominant eye if your vision is different in one eye versus the other. Another depth cue, because I said, yes, shading. That's another depth cue. It's a very powerful depth cue. And it is based on us having evolved and developed and learned in a world where light shines from above. The light source is above. The sun, the lights, that sort of thing. So we have an understanding of objects and their shadows that would imply that. So the way that you see those shadows falling is telling you something else about distance and depth which is also why the world appears so strange when you change the illumination, like hold a flashlight under your chin like little kids do so that they illuminate from the bottom up and they look very different. <laughs> you gotta stop somewhere. I could talk about it forever, <laughs> but. It is, it is, and it, What's really interesting is to see that it doesn't bother kids quite as much, depending on their age, to see some of these impossible figures because they're impossible to us given that they break all the rules. It's, they don't make sense. We don't even like to look at those that much. I mean, I, I didn't put up any of my movement, my illusory movement and that sort of thing just because People have different responses to it, and I know at least one or two of my students in perception get a little woozy from those. They're just illusion, but they are powerful. And in fact, one of the basic questions when it comes to motion that our brain have, has to answer is whether the source of the movement is us, are we moving, or is an object moving? One of the simplest cues is how much is moving. So if I have my, my water bottle and it moves, only one thing in my visual field appears to be moving, and I assign movement to the water bottle. If I move, then everything in my visual field has moved. So large-scale motion, I assume something else has moved. Which is why you will experience that feeling if you are parked in your car, and your 
car is standing still, but a big truck in the parking space next to you starts to back up and you hit your brake, <laughs> I'm moving. No, you're experiencing an illusion because most of the time, if a huge mass of your visual field moves, then you are moving. In this case, you're not moving, which brings in the idea that when your visual system and your vestibular system don't agree, your stomach doesn't like it either. So, again, illusions everywhere. That's all. Thank you.